Good morning. Thank you for making it out early and in the rain. Uh, I'm Laura Devendorf, and I'm really honored to be invited to give this talk. Really appreciate the beautiful introduction, which I think sets up the space I'm working in within HCI quite nicely. And I've been really um, honored and excited to be here for the past week working in Jim's lab uh, with all of his many talented students working on new kind of generative knitting things. So it's been a really lovely week. Um, so I'm sort of excited to cap it off with some of the things I've been thinking about. So just to give you a little bit of a context of where I'm coming from, uh, I am a researcher in the field of human-computer interaction. Within that sort of messy and wild world, I describe myself as a design researcher. So I'm often very much interested not only in what we make, but how we make it and how those processes might give rise to certain kinds of inventions. And I'm really, really interested in relationships and the ways that technology shapes our relationships, not only to our bodies, but to the worlds around us and to other people. And most specifically in the case of fabrication, how it shapes our relationship to materials and what we see materials as being good for. So I describe this um, following Phil Agri, who is an AI researcher, uh, is a critical technical practice. And the sort of one sentence tweet version of this is that I use design as a means to critique design. And it typically follows this kind of formula, right? There's sort of an existing design space that you look at, and then you say, what metaphor is sort of guiding a lot of the designs in this space? You come up with an alternative metaphor, and you redesign a system, and you see what sort of fun, wacky things happen. So if we see design in this way, we might see it as a set of possibility spaces. So this is sort of a 2D plane and I'm using this to represent all the kind of stories we tell about what we do, or all the stories we tell about design, or what design can kind of mean in the world. And inherently, we only know a subset of those stories. And the stories we tell in computational fabrication tend to take a few sort of narrative forms. It's sort of like something was hard and we made it easier. So in that case, the metaphor is that the machine is a facilitator, or that something was slow and we made it faster, so the machine is a catalyst or that something was inaccessible and we made it accessible, so the machine is an enabler. And all these uh, narratives are really helpful, but they're not everything the machines can be. And so I, what I like to think about as my design doing is not only thinking about making new machines, but thinking about how those machines actually shape our imagination of what design can be. And I'm particularly situating this in the context of some pretty pressing global challenges. And so there's a rise of literature largely coming out of the humanities about the Anthropocene. And the Anthropocene is this idea that humans have made such an impact on the world that we're actually entering a new geological epoch. And the problems facing us are massively scalable, really hard to understand, and are probably what Horst Rattel, who's an architect and, and the sort of planning theorist, would call wicked problems. And so wicked problems are kind of solutionless. They're just so messy and entangled. And so often we turn away from wicked problems as being like, oh man, I can't go there, it's too messy. But what we can do is we can start to ask new questions, or we can at least start to understand better what's happening and use that as a way to kind of inform the things we make. And so to that I'm drawing a lot from Donna Haraway. So Donna Haraway is a feminist scholar in science and technology studies, and she has been long writing about um, kind of knowledge as a situated activity that we can never sort of observe the world out there without affecting how we see it. And that in order to sort of address the Anthropocene or to work more cooperatively, we need to really start looking to new resources. And we really need to learn on a more kind of compassionate level how to care for the dirt or how to care for a chair or how to care for a person or how to care for the sky. So in forming these kind of like kinships and attachments to the world, we might be able to kind of think differently about how we're going to engage in it. And so often what she's doing is she's mixing science fact with science fiction and really trying to say, if we look in these broader time scales, if we look in science fiction, we can see worlds that aren't just feasible in a year, but in a hundred years. And we can imagine more radical ways of engaging with the world. So where we're used to seeing kind of sustainable innovation along this line about kind of technological interventions for energy harvesting or something, Using Donna Haraway kind of helps us see it a little bit differently. So this is a glove made by a former CMU student and somebody who worked with me for a bit, Jen Liu, that's about um, 
using your hands to detect soil mush moisture for mushroom hunting. So the idea is that you can get a remote reading, but if we locate it on the hand, you actually have to put your face near the dirt and you have to put your hand in it. And that sensory kind of relationship creates a very different space for noticing than sort of a disembodied data perspective. So I'm gonna move it kind of back into the fabrication space a bit. And I'm gonna draw from Jane Bennett, who's another theorist in this space who talks about the actual ethics of appreciating the world around you and the ethics of becoming really enchanted with the world around you. And so she says, to be enchanted is to be struck and shaken by the extraordinary that lives in the familiar and every day. So it's a state of interactive fascination. And I kind of like this idea because it sort of plays off interactive fabrication, which Linning really nicely introduced. So how do we start to think of fabrication as not only making things, but becoming fascinated in the world around us and how those things behave. And in doing that, I'm hoping that we can just expand our design imagination a little bit to envision alternative futures. So if we want to do this for fabrication, I sort of plug it into my formula here. And I see that we often design tools as hammers. They're tools that we say, a human wants to make this, and they want to make it in the world, and they need a hammer to sort of put it in the world. But what I think the kind of techno-science angle lends us is the question of how do we design things as microphones? How do we design tools that actually help us listen to the world and ask the materials what they might want to be before we sort of impose a form upon them? And in this, I kind of like to think, how do we design tools that make us instead of making things or make us in tandem with the things? So I'm gonna get a little bit more into some design projects here and talking about what it actually looks like um, when we change thinking about machine design to see its sort of capacity to be a microphone. And then I'm also gonna spend sort of the last half of the talk talking about smart textiles, which seems like a little bit of a disconnect, but I think if we see uh, the kind of meaning of working with materials in a really intimate sense, then we get a better understanding of what textile fabrication is all about and how it might be necessary if we're gonna work in this space. So what changes when we think of designing machines as microphones? Well, this is a kind of chart I've used for a while and it comes from theoretical conceptions of where form comes from. And there's sort of an old notion of form being or making being hylomorphic. And this sees that a human has this great idea and the stubborn world out there is not gonna let us happen and we need to beat it into submission, right? <laughs> so we need tools that actually make these materials workable for us. And it's this idea that we can invent technology to somehow pacify these materials and make them into the stuff that we envision. And this is kind of, maybe it's hyperbolic or a little provocative, but this is what I think is kind of happening in 3D printing a bit, is that we've engineered this plastic that's sort of characterless, but very easily takes on all the things that we might want it to be. So the alternative is the morphogenic kind of model of form making. And this is the idea that there is some stubborn stuff in the world, and that if we actually listen to it and talk with it or get to know it, it can actually generate ideas in our mind. And so sometimes people say it's like teasing form out of the material, or it's letting materials have their say in the things we create. So my thesis project was actually trying to redesign a 3D printer with this idea of what it means to actually come from the bottom up in 3D printing. What would it look like to more closely engage materials? And the idea turned into what I call being the machine. And so it was sort of a human 3D printer. And that came out of a bit of a practical challenge. Like I want to build, I really actually wanted to build the stick machine that was shown yesterday. And I had that idea and it was so great. I was like, oh, how would we learn how to put these things together? But how would we also learn to do it with other things like leaves or with old yarn? And then I kind of realized like, oh, I have hands and my hands are this amazing versatile tool. So what would happen if I just put my hand on a gantry? What would become possible? And I would think and kind of feel the materials. So basically I made this laser pointer and what you do with it is that you upload a 3D model you convert it to G-code, you sort of visualize it and set some parameters based on the material that you wanna make with. And I'm not gonna show the whole video, but I do have a whole video online. And then you follow the laser pointer with your materials. And so you actually have a little key fob controller and it's like an old Walkman. You can just play, pause, rewind, um, go step by step. 
And here's the machine at work. And so layer by layer, you sort of stack up your object. And what you lose in fidelity, you kind of gain in material diversity. And along the way, the materials speak to you in their sort of funny way of speaking. They sort of explode. You have this two-year-old who really, really likes your clicker. And it's overall just a very messy process. And so what you get after all of this is more or less like what you started with. But you can see if you're thinking about how the material is enacting in this form, it's much more feeling like the pancakes had some say in this than the original 3D model. So I use the system quite a lot to make lots of sort of silly things out of pipe cleaners. BB gun BBs actually are a really good material for 3D printing by hand. Uh, my background was in art, mostly in illustration, and so I actually really liked drawing the G-code paths. Um, and then I ended up making a second version that was more portable. So I was thinking, okay, well, let's just take it out of the lab and see what happens if we could actually fabricate outside. But in this whole process, it really became about labor, risk, and humility. And so this is an installation I did at TEI, and I was trying to make a five-foot Stanford bunny at Stanford. And I was going to make it out of balloons because they filled a lot of space. And I looked at the balloons very practically, like they're cheap, they're kind of big, and it would be really kind of fun to do this at Stanford. And I spent eight hours where people from the conference came over and like asked if I was okay. And then really a, just the tiniest breeze came and it was gone, right? And in this moment, it was like, oh, what a public failure. But there's this kind of interesting capacity in the system letting you fail. And in that moment of failure going, yeah, balloons don't want to do this. This was a very arrogant thing to think of balloons. And so I kind of started thinking more about what does it mean for a system to actually allow moments for failure and then humility? What would it mean if we approached something and went, yeah, that, that probably wasn't a good idea. So my argument with this is that fabrication machines can make space for unpredictability by design and do that intentionally. And that if we create that space, materials will have their kind of chance to speak. And if we listen, they'll tell us things. And they'll change us. And they'll kind of teach us how to work with them more cooperatively. But we're definitely not going to get what we want all the time. And we definitely probably aren't going to work from a plan. Right? And so this isn't what I want to use to make space shuttle parts necessarily. But as a complement to the kind of systems that we make, I think there's a rich space for systems that can embrace unpredictability in order just to give us more of a range of materials or ways of kind of working with computational forms. So in a lot of this, and I have a few papers, I'm drawing a lot from kind of 1960s chance-based performance art. And in a lot of these practices, you see that this isn't just sort of a funny thing to make my machines sound nice even though they don't work at all, right? They do work, I've made things. But there's actually reasons that people want to constructively engage unpredictability in design for a lot of different reasons. But it can be frustrating. And so recently, I've been sort of revisited by the ghost of Haraway. She's not dead. I don't know why, but I could see her as a ghost and sort of like swimming into space or something. And this is actually maybe necessary. So if we want to live more cooperatively in the world and we want to collaborate with machines and other materials, Collaboration doesn't mean getting what you want all the time. If we've ever been part of a collaboration with another human, we often see it's a process of negotiation. So how do we deal with these moments where the material tells us, no, I do not want to do that? When do we choose to keep going? And when do we choose to just sort of uh, kind of let the materials beat us in that moment? So kind of back to the formula, just as more of a kind of conceptual idea, I've been playing around with what the alternative metaphor of necessary frustration would be. And if we saw frustration as sort of a necessary part of living cooperatively, what would fabrication systems look like? And so this is sort of where the wind loom sort of played in. So the wind loom is a loom with the pattern that's set by the wind. And so each one of these uh, wind umbrellas is attached to a heddle. When the wind glow glows, blows, the heddle pushes forward and it creates a shed, which is where you kind of throw your, your weft yarn to make your pattern. And the idea here is that the different heights of the umbrellas actually um, activate at different wind speeds. But actually using this was one of the more frustrating activities. One, because the wind was never predictable. Every time it was really windy, I didn't have this massive wind loom. And every time I had the wind loom, it was never quite windy enough. 
Even so, it only captures the wind in one direction. So oftentimes, using the system just looked like this, which August very nicely captured for me in the backyard as I was waiting for wind to use the wind loom. So I like to kind of think that if we embrace frustration, we might create machines for making time or machines for waiting. And in these moments of waiting, they're not idle. They're kind of rich moments where we're able to just think and relax and not look at our phones, right? And so we can think of ways that machines might just create space for us to even notice the world around us. The second kind of project I've been doing around this is much more personal, and it's a bit of an autobiographical project, just thinking about how HCI deals with frustration. And so we've never actually looked at the boogeyman and been, what's happening here, right? So often when we design, we say, this is hard, it's difficult, we must innovate it, right? And that's great, it's really great to have that desire, but I just kinda wanna look at the frustration part and go, is this really so bad? What are we actually encountering here? And how do we even understand that experience? And so I should say that this coincided a lot with having two kids. And if you've ever had children, you know there's a certain necessary frustration to being a caregiver. That kid does not do what you want all the time. And it's not really good at communicating. So we like to think that humans and non-humans are totally different. But if you're working with clay and an infant, there's not a whole lot of difference. One's just a lot louder and pees on you. All right. So I was really inspired by this book about the spacesuit, and the spacesuit was sort of described as a body architecture. So it's not a garment, it's a system that makes your body able to adapt to an environment in which it was not well suited. And in its sort of ways that it makes your body adapt, it kind of makes visible the things that are out there that you're protecting yourself from. So I tried to create a series of my own kind of exoskeletons that would sort of deal with my own frustrations as a parent. So if I could sort of innovate in parenting, what would this look like? And so the first one is the nipple poncho. So I hand crocheted a series of pacifier nipples. Um, my youngest daughter is too old for a pacifier, but did really go nuts for this. Um, and it kind of represents this idea of like, it's natural to want to suck. That's what the first thing babies do when they come out is they suck. And I think there's a certain way in the kind of more political space that when women kind of enter the workforce or they're still expected to kind of be nurturers and caregivers. And so this was sort of just a bit of a way to shout for me about what I felt like I was expected to be in the world and how that frustration isn't something I want to innovate away or maybe go protest about. I just wanted to make it visible in my own way through design. So the second kind of garment in this series, I'm calling the, it's, I call it the exoskeleton for sedimentation. So I was really interested in erosion patterns and the idea of thinking about the ways bodies erode on each other. So when you're holding a child or you have a partner for a long time, there's a lot of contact there and you might think about the different ways that you form each other. So what this garment has, and I'll actually pass it around, it has I think 13 embedded force sensors distributed throughout it and they all hook up to a microcontroller in the back there, which I need to design. Um, and the idea is that it would actually take a picture of the forces on your body over time. So instead of eliminating the frustration, you're sort of commemorating it. Like, I made it through, it was okay, and I'm actually genuinely changed because of it. Um, so I'll pass this around. And it's not delicate, so, you know, do your thing. So the last one I actually kind of made this week with Jim and Leah, um, thinking about textures that we could achieve in knitting. Uh, that knitting machine is fast and really exciting. Uh, and I was really kind of interested in these sort of reptilian skins or skin folds. And I was inspired by this sort of hyper endurant creature that can live without water for several years. Um, and so the third exoskeleton I think is sort of in the works at this space of thinking about kind of protective ways that you can uh, survive and endure. All right, so I'm gonna get to more practical things now, I promise. And I wanna sort of shift this into like, yes, these were all kind of very strange art projects. They were ways of using design in a way that maybe we don't typically think about it or talk about it. But there's actually very practical implications of this work. And specifically in context like textiles fabrication, which I very lovingly like to call fun straighting. It's very, very fun, but it takes forever and it's hard. 
And that's kind of part of what it means. Actually, not with the knitting machine. That thing is amazing. But with weaving. <laughs> I'm a weaver, and weaving is still very hard. This is why last week was sort of like a crisis of consciousness, because I've been like, labor is good, and it's so wonderful. And I was like, oh, this knitting machine is fantastic. I like, I like fast and efficient things now. So anyway, I run a lab at CU Boulder, and I have a, a three PhD students now and several undergrads and grad students coming from all different fields. And so some are actually in more formal art programs, other in information science, HCI, electrical engineering. And we're all working together to kind of think about how we can develop um, smart textiles. So a lot of this work happened somewhat serendipitously for me in my last year of the PhD. I was invited into a collaboration with Google Advanced Technology and Projects to think about um, how we could make new kinds of interactive clothing. And I had worked in fashion for several years before I studied computer science. So it was kind of an interesting moment to be like, oh yeah, I guess I kind of know something about fabrics and it would be fun to play them out in this way. So what we ended up developing is they made a yarn that can withstand industrial manufacturing and it's a resistive heater. So it has three cores of magnet wire and then it's coated, I think this iteration was in cotton. And so what we did is we realized, kind of based on a lot of prior work, that if you coat um, that cotton in a thermochromic pigment, when you run the wire that's the resistive heater, it changes the color. So we did a big study exploring the different kind of display elements you might want to put on a textile, but maybe more importantly, asking people, why would you ever wear this? And the idea is in a whole paper, but I'm not going to go into it here. What I wanted to talk about here was more the fabrication side. So in this project, we actually sent out our files to a weaver who wove them and sent them back to us. And that was all good and fine, but given that I'm kind of preaching about the importance of material speaking, I felt like it would be really important to learn to weave on my own. And that in learning to weave, I might actually have a much better embodied sense of how to actually embed these materials or it's the ways that it could be possible. So here I was actually trying to make um, just some simple force sensors on the fabric um, and really just experimenting with different structures. And this is a frame loom. So just to give you a little kind of primer on how weaving works, you have a series of threads that are sort of stretched along two bars, that's called the warp. And then you raise certain threads on these sort of needly things that are called heddles. And then you throw the weft through the shed, which is the space that's created in between. And that's all weaving is, is it's just sort of um, sequential instructions of which needles to lift and lower. And you denote that on a draft. And a draft is graph paper or a bitmap image. And the black squares tell you which heddles to lift in the row, and the white squares just leave the heddles down. So in that way, every pattern is sort of made. So we bought a fancy jacquard loom uh, with some support from the university and from an NSF grant. Um, and this and a, um, jacquard loom is unique because in that first loom you saw, I have to pre-thread the frames. So I can only make a certain number of patterns. But on this loom, I can control each heddle individually. So you get a lot more, um, a bigger design space in the possible patterns. And this loom, um, eats bitmaps and spits out fabrics, and you're still there throwing the shuttle across, so there's still human involvement. So this is a file I made for a three-level weave, or a three-layer weave. And if you look close up, all it is is a series of these kind of pixel instructions row by row. And the current state of the art in designing is this spiral-bound book called The Woven Pixel. So. I'm very excited because coming from computational design, there's a lot of interesting things we could be playing with here. And there's a lot of interesting infrastructure in prototyping scale weaving machines, kind of like the Knitter 8's coming out for knitting. The TC2 is really sitting in a more consumer-oriented market. And it's probably the same cost as about a high-end laser cutter. So we do need kind of, I think we can make use of this, and there's a lot of potential there, but I think we need help. And we kind of need help because weaving has this insanely long history. And if we compare that to computing, computing's there. And this is all the years we've been kind of innovating in textile infrastructures. Yet when I look at sort of material science papers or things coming out, um, even of my own field, we have 9,000 years of innovation. And most smart textiles are made with the most basic 9,000-year-old stitch. 
And I think this is because it's been largely seen as the domain of material scientists. So we'll make these new yarns, and as long as we can sort of throw the yarn in a fabric, it's a textile. But there's a lot of different possibilities in textile structures. They're not always flat. And if you think about the sensing in tandem with the sort of geometric structure, a lot more things might be possible. You can create a kind of waffle weave, which you've seen on a dish towel. But if you embed a resistive wire within that, you get a force sensor. And so that's actually what's on the shawl I'm passing around. And that force sensor is actually a pretty robust resistive measurement. I thought it would be flakier, but it's been pretty predictable. You can also do multi-layered weaves. You can weave tunnels and arbitrary paths. And so you can imagine you can throw anything in there, right? Let's throw some pneumatics in there, or throw some wire, <laughs> wires or cabling. And you can create these new kinds of forms. But we really just don't have design tools to do that. So part of this was kind of thinking about how do we actually design the tools for this space in collaboration with textile craftspeople? And how do we collaborate in the way that might kind of be frustrating? Right, so not just like, oh, craftsperson, come here and give us your knowledge, but actually we kind of want to do this other thing, really working together to see what's possible in this space. And I want to maybe clarify some misconceptions about textile craftspeople, that they have this kind of rich body of knowledge through material experience. A very close friend of mine said, you can learn to weave in three minutes and it can take you a lifetime to be any good at it. So these people actually have a tacit and embodied knowledge that's really, really useful and important. And that probably can't be abstracted into an algorithm. They're not afraid of technology. Actually, they're quite insanely smart about algorithms because weaving is highly algorithmic, right? And they wanna work with new technology and they're frustrated that the tools aren't there for them. Historically, craft has always been seen as women's work and it's not because we women are naturally drawn to textiles. It's because socially there's a history that has allowed women to do work in this space. And so we see in women's work the first 20,000 years, there's a lot of arguments about early kind of prehistoric social structures that kept women actually making the fabrics because they also had to care for children. The second book, Women's Work, is about the Bauhaus and how actually women at the Bauhaus were not often allowed to take the painting classes and that they were told they needed to stay in the textiles workshops. The other kind of histories intersect with technology. So early chip manufacturing was uh, co-located on Navajo reservations, and it was marketed as having the innate quality of Navajo skill, when really it's sort of ignoring the fact that these people didn't have a whole lot of job options, and they were just told to do this labor. This isn't their inborn calling. And finally, the early Apollo missions were crafted with core memory made by hand, and it was called Little Old Lady Memory. And these histories aren't often remembered as part of the critical infrastructure of technology. So this is kind of a way to say, women have been in tech for a long time. We just haven't really counted them. And we don't seem to remember them in the histories. That might have come off stronger than I meant, but I think it's important to recognize like what we call innovation in some ways. So we started doing a lot of workshops in this space, working with SparkFun, who's local to Boulder, and also a local weaving company and some other scholars and people on campus to talk about what's even gonna make a good collaboration. And good collaboration, we kind of realized, comes from people having the ideas together, not by sort of having an idea first and finding someone later. And so as part of that, we started developing out this tool. We thought, okay, well at the very least, we need a tool for documenting textiles with embedded circuitry. And we worked closely both with engineers and craftspeople to make this. But we actually sort of kept it in the language of craft. We didn't abstract this away entirely to scripting because there's a certain way these drafts have always been sort of refined to represent this information. They always already kind of have a following and a cachet within the community. We also were releasing um, all of our tools open source and inviting the community to collaborate. And the third thing that we're doing that I'm most excited about is we launched um, an art residency with support from the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design. And so this brings a craftsperson onto our research team for six weeks. We pay them as a researcher, and we include them as a researcher. So we're gonna come up with the ideas together. Uh, we use an advisory board for oversight, so people who have a lot more knowledge of art and craft and residency structures that we can ask to make sure we're being fair. 
And we have this endorsement from kind of a respected organization, which has really helped. And I'm still working with the university to see what possibilities there are for intellectual property, which can be really important in residencies. We got 200 applications from weavers all over the world, internationally, in the global south, in the global norths. And a huge amount of these weavers were highly technical. So these are just some of the examples. This is sort of custom generative jacquard weaving script to sort of show um, interference patterns. This is woven hollow tubes with ink pumped into them. So they actually make these massive displays. And this is custom shape weaving. So you can make an entire garment in one piece. These people did not go to engineering programs. They're coming out of textile design programs. So we chose Sandra, who's gonna join us next week. She weaves solar cells, and so we're gonna start working on that. We're excited. All right, I made promises of radical possibility, and I will get to that now. Uh, so one of the things I think is really exciting in the more practical space of smart textiles is the idea to see a fabric as an entire PCB. And you can actually route materials through the fabric in arbitrary ways, and these fabrics can be multi-layered, so you can feasibly make multi-layered PCB structures. And you can make them in a way where you don't actually really see them. They're sort of seamlessly embedded in the garment. What I think is kind of most exciting about this is there's no adhesive, right? So you can actually just pull the conductive element right out if you need to. So this is actually the wiring diagram for the, the shawl I'm passing around. The second kind of experiment we were doing drew from some of the Google Jacquard work, but really playing more with thermochromics and um, pairing that with force sensing. So this was sort of an early prototype for the shawl I'm passing around that actually measures where the body's being pressed and plays it back with a color change in real time. And so I coated these thermochromic threads with pigments that activate at two different temperatures. And so you can set it to go from blue to pink or pink to white. Um, and in the back, I have all these press pads sort of integrated to measure where it's being pushed. We have these double layered structures that create tubes. They don't always have to run horizontally. They can run in arbitrary paths through the fabric. And basically, this is kind of what you've seen in a lot of sort of floral or uh, jacquard fabric fabrics in the past, only they haven't been used as tunnels for, say, tendons. They've been used for decorative patterning. But if we see these as sort of structures, we can start imagining all the things we could sort of embed in there and how that might sort of make the fabrics more dynamic. So one of my PhD students is sort of leveraging this idea of the unweavability of textiles to think about different ways that we might actually be able to create, um, use computational design to optimize our patterns so we can unravel them in one piece. So knitting is sort of known for its ability to unravel. Weaving typically isn't because woven patterns have all the individual warps and then they're cut and sewn into pieces. So all you get out are these kind of shreds of fabric. So Chanel's been experimenting with a lot of ways that we can create a continuous warp and then adjust it after the fact so that you can still get more useful thread out of the systems. This is particularly kind of interesting for smart textiles because there's certain materials we have, we have these like carbon nanotube yarns that we do not want to waste, right? So you can imagine you can create your circuit prototype and if it doesn't work, you can mend it or you can take it out, right? And so you don't actually have to be creating prototypes that just sort of sit there being unused. And the second thing I like to think about is just new ways of doing the composition of textiles. So instead of sort of designing your vision, what does it look like to do something that's a bit more generative or even a bit more musical in some ways? So this is an interface uh, where Natalia actually mapped each key on the keyboard to a different weaving stitch. And it's just based on the ASCII kind of translation. And then that shifts into a twill based on the kind of uh, bit representation of the different characters. And so then what we did is we actually composed weaves by writing texts and composed texts by writing weaves and then wove them out to kind of see the structure in the fabrics. So in terms of other radical possibility, I kind of like to think of the future of smart textiles being really richly crafted. I like the idea that I might go to a tailor and we might custom make something together instead of buying something sort of mass market off the shelf. I like the idea of them being really materially rich and colorful. And I might like to even imagine the future where we sort of get beyond the rectangle, right? Where things sort of take on different shapes and more organic forms. 
So while I think we have these amazing tools for intervention, I'm really excited about how we sort of pair the imagination and the intervention. And if we are gonna sort of address these global challenges, I really like to draw from Sarah Ahmed's uh, quote that says, if we are gonna have a movement, it requires us to be moved. So how do we think about other ways of moving ourselves to consider kind of more radical alternative futures? Thank you.